Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So this week's video is probably the most highly requested topic um, ever on the channel so far, and that is the Chopin Ocean Etude Opus 25 number 12. And there was one particular viewer who has asked me and asked me and asked me to make this video for a really long time, and I told them I would in the beginning, and then I sort of uh, was postponing making it because I've actually never played this etude. And I thought to really do it justice, to really have a really uh, in-depth tutorial, I needed to play it, maybe even perform it, and just sort of, um, you know, sit with it for a few months and really, really get to know it well. Um, due to other projects and upcoming performances and teaching and, and family, uh, you know, obviously this year has been crazy. Um, it just hasn't happened. So I was looking, planning out videos recently, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to make a short video where I'm going to basically just sit down and look at it for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and I'm going to think about, you know, what are the main things, the main technical issues that um, someone would come across in learning this piece, and what are things that I think would help someone else, or what helped me in just thinking about it and just sort of playing through it. Um, this certainly is not going to be an up-to-tempo uh, demonstration of it or anything like that. We're just going to start by talking about the three main uh, technical challenges and technical solutions to those challenges. And then at the end, I'm going to give two kind of like uh, bonus tips, um, ideas that I think would help anyone in uh, learning this etude. So I will do a full tutorial really thorough uh, once I've had the chance to learn it, probably after the new year or sometime this next summer. Uh, it'll just depend, but um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about the main technical challenges. Now, um, we're gonna mainly focus on the first page because um, the rest of the piece is uh, largely the same. We have these, these arpeggiated figures throughout most of it. Now there are um, obviously not every arpeggio as, is as simple as that first uh, C minor arpeggio, but we're going to just mainly focus on the first page um, because I think that it can be applied to the rest of the piece. So um, the first technical challenge, the main technical challenge that I see is the fact that these arpeggios we have in the beginning, so for instance, and uh, if we look at the right hand, where we have E flat, G, and E flat. And then um, I have to, of course, play that again up three octaves and then back down. And the main issue here is that this spans an octave, and so the hand will have a tendency to reach to that octave and then play and stay stretched out the whole time. Now, this is a problem because requires a tremendous amount of muscular activity to open the hand like this, especially this is a little bit of a stretchy position for my hand, and I have actually quite large hands. So the what we want to make sure we do as we play this is we want to make sure that we start in a position. My, my hand can be slightly extended, but I don't want to feel like I have to place my fifth finger over the top of this E flat an octave higher. I want to just feel like I can have my hand here, and I shift, and then my hand shifts over. And notice that my thumb comes with me. My thumb does not stay over here. So it's sort of like this. So I want to feel like I play a note, and then I shift to the new note, and then I shift to that new note, and my hand comes along with me. Um, you can think, if you have trouble with that, you can think sort of letting, or sort of like pulling your hand in the direction that you're going. The hand can extend ahead a little bit, and that's fine. But if it goes too much, that can be a problem. So I want to try to make sure that my hand is sort of always doing this as I'm moving up. Now, rather than thinking of the hand pulling in, I would think of the fingers releasing. Okay, so in other words, as I play this, I release my thumb, and then I release my fifth finger, or my uh, second finger, excuse me, and then I play my thumb, then I release my thumb, release my second finger, etc. And on the way down, it's the opposite, right? I'm going to release my fifth finger, right? Release my thumb, obviously, and then release my fifth finger. Okay, so you want to avoid stretching at all costs. And it's the same thing, of course, 
on any of the other um, the other parts as well. Okay, so I would practice that, and even in the left hand, making sure that your hand is not staying stretched out, but it's always sort of returning to this closed position, so that the muscles have a chance to sort of release um, between. Every, every time you have to extend your hand, okay? Now the second uh, main technical challenge that I see is as we play this, um, I have to play E flat, G, E flat, and I have to play that same E flat with my thumb. So five to thumb, five to thumb, right? And then thumb to five, thumb to five, etc. And of course it's the same on any of the other ones, okay? Now there's two different ways we could think about this. We could think of we could think of pulling the hand like so. But I think the problem with this is that the hand goes from a playing position where the fingers are in this they're sort of uh, you know curved shape, and my hand gets contorted into this like almost fist shape. And so that's not going to be very effective. A lot of times that's how people want to play that. They want to just sort of pull their hand in like this, like a, like a squid or something, right? But actually, if you apply rotation to this, okay? So in other words, I'm going to think about just rotating in this direction. And notice what happens. Actually, if I do this with my left hand, it's probably um, more visible. But if I rotate in the direction I'm going, see how my thumb is right there? And then I rotate back right there and I rotate back. Now obviously this is combined with the previous uh, point which is making sure that the, the fingers are releasing and the hand is not staying stretched out. Because if your hand is stretching and you're still using rotation there's still going to be tension. So we want to make sure that my fingers are releasing as I do this. really really well it makes that feel really easy now you also want to make sure that you feel a little bit of rotation across the whole arpeggio so I can think rotate left right right then too far left right right left right right left left right left left right left, left. and I would actually practice it like that and then after that becomes more comfortable the main thing of course is going from five to one so I would just practice just doing that and making sure that as you go from fifth finger to thumb, it's really fast. And then same thing all the way down. I just practice that. See how fast you can do that, actually. It's a really, really fast, really efficient movement. Now, of course, it's the same thing in the left hand. Um, arpeggio there but that's sort of the idea okay now the third technical challenge and then the solution is if we look at measures seven and eight we have a change in the pattern so we have this arpeggiated figure that comes up and then we have this thing sort of thing here and forgive my my plunking out the notes um, but we're mainly just focusing on on technique how would we play this so this is going to be we're going to think rotation forearm and then here we want to think circle so I'm going to circle up down over un, under here Too. We want to think of playing that with rotation. And it actually is quite easy to practice that because the hands are kind of doing the same thing together. Now here with this circle, the right hand is going to be going under to the top, over to the bottom, under, over, um, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over, okay? The right hand is going to be doing, or sorry, the left hand is going to be doing the opposite, over, over, 
So the hands are going to be circling sort of um, as opposites, okay, which is a little bit hard to do. Um... So you have to sort of, it takes a little bit of, uh, of practice to kind of get through that. Now there's a two little... Uh, bonus tips that I wanted to talk about that I think um, really uh, are helpful in thinking about in this piece. The first one is um, using time to help with uh, technical issues. So one thing that I noticed in listening to a few recordings um, over the years, but even recently in preparing for this video, every single pianist takes a lot of time on the very first measure, or, or sorry, the very first note of each measure. So in other words, they start here, and it they, they take time. Right, so they take a little bit of time on that bottom. It's not just, right, they don't just play that straight. Um, they actually take a little time on the bottom, and that helps with two things. The first thing it helps with is it helps with making sure you can get a really good accent and control that note because you're not just coming down and just crashing into that note, okay? Um, the second thing is it makes it a little bit me less monotonous because it's not just, you know, strictly metronomic, okay? And so sometimes you hear people play it and every note is, you know, perfectly with the metronome and after about the first page and a half, it's kind of boring. And so taking a little bit of time, um, even just on some of the arpeggio sections, like, you know, measures one through six, they're just arpeggios going up and down the keyboard, but taking time when you get down to that bottom note. So you take time, and you're in tempo here, and time there. Right, taking a little bit of time on that bottom note. So we kind of hear this Of hear a little bit more of that versus just straight arpeggios up and down because it just gets really boring. All right, so the second tip that I have is uh, something that I heard a pianist say some time ago now, and that is that 90% of forte is piano. And it sounds like one of those things that like people say, but it really doesn't mean anything. Like, what does that mean? 90% of forte is piano. Um, but he went on to explain that when you're playing something, like this etude is actually a perfect example, you, you can't think just because it's marked forte that every single note is forte, all right? You have to think your phrasing, and that's actually where those accents come in, right? If I think about this note as forte, and then maybe the rest of these notes are mezzo forte, help me immensely for two reasons. First of all, it will musically sound a lot better, but also I'm going to be less liable to get really tired. If I'm trying to pound, if I'm trying to pound every single note like that, um, so that every note is, is forte and the, the accented notes maybe are fortissimo or something, I'm going to get tired really, really fast because I'm putting so much energy into every single note for measure upon measure upon measure, countless 16th notes, I'm going to get really tired. And then his other point with that 90% of Forte's piano is that actually then we lose a sense of phrasing, we lose a sense of um, basically where, where the music is going, right? So maybe actually it's better to think of these accented notes as Forte and the rest of them as mezzo piano because we want to be able to hear distinct notes and not just this massive blur of, you know, notes that we can't really hear distinctly, but it's just sort of mashed together. And so um, I think that that's really, really helpful in thinking of this. You know, even when I was uh, just sort of, you know, playing through a few different sections of this piece, what I noticed is that if you play these, just these first few measures, and I... Accent this first. I 
actually hear I hear more of an arpeggio versus if I try to play every note. There's just so much sound. And if you'll notice Chopin's pedaling is that first measure is supposed to be one pedal there. And so that's really important both musically as well to make sure that it's not just this sort of blur of sound. So I would actually think of the accented notes as forte, whatever the, let's see, top note is. So, whatever the top note is. But I would think about those notes as being forte, and I would think about the other notes as being actually mezzo piano. And I think that the overall sound will be a lot better. So um, that's all I have um, for today. Like I mentioned, I feel like to really do this etude justice, I need to actually spend a couple of months and really learn it, um, perform it, and actually just get really, really familiar with it. And so in the future, I will be uploading a really in-depth tutorial in a couple parts um, once I've had a chance to really um, work through it. Um, right now I have a bunch of other uh, music piano projects that are in the works. So look out for those um, both in tutorials and performances. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that that was informative and helpful. If you have any questions or comments, or if you appreciated the video, make sure and let me know in the comments down below. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.